Putting my extremely profoundly disabled seven-year-old into a mental institution so I can forget he exists, and I don't feel bad about it one bit. I can't tell anyone this, even my therapist. Lamb based me if you want and maybe I even deserve it. I only ask what you would do if you were in my situation, not what you think people should do, what you would really do. I'm a single mom of two boys, 12 and 7. My husband passed away three years ago in a work accident. A very large portion of me believe it was a UN aliving. I can't see him ever making the mistake he made that caused his death, and he had taken an action just before that which ensured his co-workers weren't in the room. I fully believe he unalived himself because of our younger son and no one will ever change my mind. We were told when I was pregnant that he would have Down syndrome. We could handle that, even if it was severe. It turned out he has a chromosome deletion. His disorder is kind of rare so I won't post which specific one but suffice to say he'll never be anything more than he is now or has ever been. And what he is, is nothing. He doesn't appear to have any awareness and never has. His eyes are locked in one position. He doesn't respond to noise, touch, or pain. He is total care. He is capable of nothing. He is tube fed and on oxygen. He is in diapers and will be forever. He makes no sounds, no attempts to communicate. He never even really cried as a baby. He has never made an attempt to interact with anyone or his environment. I'm not upset because I got a special needs or imperfect child. I feel the way I feel because this thing takes up 200% of my time and does nothing. I didn't get an imperfect child. I didn't get a child. I don't love him. He doesn't have any personality. There is nothing to love. And yet I'm responsible for him. In addition to his extreme delays he's also medically fragile. Respiratory crises, fecal impactions, his autonomic nervous system doesn't function properly, issues with his G-tube, infections, pressure sores no matter what we put him on or how we position him. Our older son has suffered because his non-existent brother has colored everything in his life. He's had medical care get delayed because there's only one of me and Haas brother is more critical. We do have a visiting home nurse but only 20 hours a week and we aren't eligible for more. I was starting law school, I gave up my dreams and my plan for my children for this potato. My older son can't do a lot of things he wants to do because of the younger's need for care and appointments. The final straw was I heard a sound. I went into younger son's room to check, thinking he had forgotten how to breathe again, and saw older son hitting him and screaming you're why I don't have a mother. You're why I don't have a father. You're why I can't have friends over. You're why I can't be in sports. I didn't ask for you and I hope you die. Instead of being horrified, I watched. And younger son just did. Not. React. No signs of pain or fear mm. or upset. No reaction at all. He breathes but he is not alive. He doesn't know who I am. He doesn't know who older son is. He has no sense of self, life experience, or awareness of his surroundings. He doesn't need to be in my home. He doesn't know or care where he is. He is genetically my son but he is not family. My previously oh. abused, brain-damaged cat who can't walk straight has more personality and is far more lovable oh. than my child. In fact I was looking forward to raising a Downs baby, even one with severe impairments, for that reason. With disability can come gifts. This boy is not a gift. He is a genetic mistake I probably should have miscarried and would have definitely terminated if I'd known he would be like this. And the flip side is, if he has awareness. He's miserable, and there is nothing I can do. Mm. If he has likes and dislikes no one knows what they are. If he is in pain he can't tell anyone. If he wants anything, he can't communicate. He's had every imaginable therapy, nothing has made a difference. And so he's leaving our home on the 29th. I feel excited and relieved and then guilty because I know we'll be happier with him gone. He's already taken my husband and my son's father. He was working so 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 much overtime to pay for the cucumbers care. For the experimental therapies insurance wouldn't cover. Because this one was going to be the breakthrough. He was tired and defeated and disappointed. He sought counseling as well but I don't think he could ever say the words I don't want my son in my home either. He's ruined my older son. I was so wrapped up on the younger I never realized how ignored and damaged he was. He lost his father too. I didn't just lose my husband. He is my priority now and this malignant lump can be someone else's problem. At least they'll be paid a wage to care for him. At least they'll get a break from him when they punch out. I just want to never think of him again and I'm not sorry. And for that, I'm sorry. All right, today's video is a little harder to decipher or come to a conclusion. So I'm going to ask us to like really challenge ourselves and really think this one through. Okay, so welcome back to my channel. My name is Brittany Simon. In today's video, we are going to examine this story and we're gonna judge it on whether or not it's healthy, happy, or kind. And that's really, really difficult since this is a very challenging story. Now, this is my second time hearing the story and it's just as shocking as the first. I wrote down a few notes of things that stood out to me and I'm very curious on what stood out to you when you were watching it. So leave that in the comment sections down below. This is very difficult as somebody who's 34 in a relationship and and contemplating having children, one of the obvious concerns is that the child will have a lot of challenges. And much like this original um, writer, this original person, I also am open to the challenges of unique children. But even I have a limit because I'm a human and I'm worried. Now, I'm worried just to have a healthy, healthy, healthy child considering that I suffer from fibromyalgia and mental health issues. And so it's a little bit difficult. Um, you know, I think our genetics together would probably produce a child who would have challenges. And though we're open and we would love that child no matter what, it is very difficult to imagine 
the severity in which your child could ex- could come could be conditioned. Their condition could be there. Okay. So it's even difficult to talk about it. There are words she used that actually like it hurt me a little bit. You know, when she called him a potato or a cucumber or a malignant lump, that hurts me. You know, it's so funny when we talk about mental health and we talk about the rejection of gay kids or children that are different in the home, atheist kids in religious homes, we never consider the rejection of disabled children. Or maybe we do, but it's not talked about as much because it is rare. Like this person said, it is rare. This His disease is so rare that she was afraid to name it in case we could find out who she was. So if you think about it, the people in the world who are experiencing like severe, severe, severe disability are having a relationship with reality that we're not even happen- having when we're talking about like, oh my gosh, what if I have a gay kid? What if I have a trans kid? What if I have it? A- we're dealing with a, a possible challenge that's going to be much more common. My mom and dad had 10 kids and three of us are queer. So you can see that, you know, that's that's more than possible, more than easy to deal with, though harder for religious parents, of course. And then like there's autism in my family. There's ADHD in my family. There's borderline in my family. There's PTSD in my family. All of that, you know, we could always handle as a family unit. Mental health is pretty prevalent. And I don't know if it's our Middle Eastern genetics or just the fact that we come from war torn countries or the fact that there's a lot of cultural rejection. But none of us really suffer from extreme disability. And so, again, we can just sit here and pretend what would I do if I have a disabled kid? Of course, I would love them, especially coming from a Catholic background. There's a lot of all children are God's children, so all children should be loved and no children should be aborted. And the mother in this this story literally said that if she knew her son would come out like this, she would have aborted. And I, because I am pro-choice, think that that's really reasonable. And then when I talk about the ethics or the morals of the situation, I think about what's good for society and what's good for me. I do remember that I think it was Australia where the Down syndrome population was protesting their abortion because there was a commonality that Down syndrome babies would be aborted. But then people felt like we were ben- they were being genocided, right? So I think there's something to be said about people who are dis- disabled. They could feel targeted because, quote unquote, non-disabled people are targeting them to be aborted, which is kind of scary, right? Does everyone have the right to exist or not? And then the mother even acknowledged, right, that her son could have a consciousness, could have an awareness, and nobody would know, and nobody would be able to communicate with him. So there's a lot of layers of difficult, like this is very difficult, right? It's interesting, though, because when you're unprepared in having a child with severe disability, and again, I'm speaking as somebody who hasn't had a child because I know I'm not prepared to have that child, right? I'm not prepared to have a child who's severely disabled. I'm not financially prepared. I'm not emotionally prepared. I don't have a home. I don't have a consistent uh, understanding of where I'm going to live next year. Like, I don't have the tools. I can see how it can feel, like she said, that this thing, that's her word, not mine, kind of ruined her life. She had to drop out of law school. Her husband killed himself. The older son feels neglected. I can see her perspective of wanting to put all the blame on this child. But man, I don't know if it's my conservative upbringing, but a part of me was like, why did you make a baby you weren't prepared to take care of? But of course, they probably didn't think about it because most people aren't thinking about it. They just fall in love, make love, have a baby. Nobody is ever prepared to be the very unique statistic of having such a disabled child that they are basically non-existent, right? You've basically had a child who's in a long-term coma. And so the question is, you know, could you feel love for this child? Now, in my head, of course, I'm imagining that I'd be able to love this child. That, again, is speaking from a perspective of like, I love all children, like all babies are valuable babies. And that comes from a a perspective of I've never met a baby like this. I have no lived experience of having a baby in this position. The closest I can think of is a family member married into the family family member who has a very unique child who's so lovely, such an angel, such a sweet little bundle of beans. Like she's so cute and she has a severe disability in which she won't really age, right? She'll be a, a baby and she'll be very fragile for the rest of her life. But she's the loveliest, most wonderful human. But I know it is stressful. So I can understand a little bit using her as the example, but she's quite aware. She reacts. She's not verbal, but she's got a personality. So this girl let you know. So it's different. This this bundle of bean who is severely disabled is also very communicative. She's got a lot of opinions, 
But if I had a baby that was not communicative, truly unable to communicate, I wonder if I could have a re healthy relationship with that baby. Could I remain happy? And could I be kind to both the baby and myself? So we are rating this situation on its ability to be healthy, happy, and kind. And it's asking a lot of a human being without the preparedness to be healthy and to be happy and to be kind when you're dealing with someone who's basically in a chronic coma. Now, of course, they're not. And so that's even more difficult. And I understand her desire to take it to a facility, the boy to the facility. Oh, I just called it an it. Is that me? Is that me <laughs> bringing her verbiage into my life? Or am I now? It's hard to imagine him. But I will say this. I'm a little sad that she wasn't joyful to give her son the care he needed. Instead, she was relieved to get rid of this thing, this potato, this malignant malignant lump she doesn't want to and does not love. And I think that's what hurts. I think what hurts is that I do believe in the consciousness. I do believe in kind of like the soul. And so I believe like everyone is like a unique part of the consciousness. And I do believe that her son has a humanity to him. And I I'm bummed that she got to the point in her life and her husband maybe allegedly committed suicide because of this child. I'm sad that they weren't given the tools, I think, to be happy, to care for their son in a way that was healthy. Instead of the narrative being what it was, I wish it was, I cannot believe I finally worked hard enough to offer my son a facility that will care for him in the way that I can't. Instead, it's, oh, now it's somebody else's problem. And I think there's something really sad for her in this regard. Like, look, if her son genuinely doesn't have a relationship with his consciousness, whatever that means, or doesn't have an awareness that we know of, let's say he really is just like not even aware in his own mind. And let's pray that that is the case because I would be very sad for him if he was just living in his own head and he couldn't see what was happening or had a relationship with the world or, or he did see what was happening. Wait, I would be sad if he was trapped in his head and could see what was happening and couldn't relate to the, like couldn't speak to the world. That would be very difficult. So let's hope there's kind of nothing going on over there. But what I'm sad about, okay, is that she isn't healthy in relation to herself, happy in relation to herself, and kind in relation to herself. I think she probably felt the pressures of being a good mom so much so that it made her a bad one. I think the dad, if he really did unalive himself because of his child situation, it was like they didn't have the perspective that I was really blessed with in life to kind of grow up with this idea that this is a unique burden to you. And I know I grew up religious, and though I'm an atheist now, there is something to be said about the idea that like God doesn't give you burdens you can't handle. And I think I would have been able to be optimistic about the situation as much as it would have been very difficult. And I don't see any of the optimism. And a part of me can't help but kind of gay judge. Like I'm a little judging. I'm not judging him as a good or bad person, but I'm kind of like casting judgment on the idea that the father would have unalived himself abandoning his wife and his firstborn son just because the secondborn son is not communicating. I think that's really hard for me to process. And I do kind of look down on people that choose, you know, but then again, so like unaliving yourself is usually the pressure from despair. It's not like the father, I think, made the decision really. I think when people commit unaliving they're committing a, a desperate like they're desperate and so they think this is the only way out like it feels like this family was just so unprepared that they could not love themselves nor this child but this is a real human being and I think it poses the question to all of us as we move into the next version of humanity the next part of our evolution our social evolution how do we feel about these kinds of circumstances. Do we feel justified in giving that child a way out into the afterlife, whatever that is? Do we feel like all human life is sacred and we shouldn't be terminating life? Do we feel like we should have the funds to care for unique cases? How do we feel about the fact that so many of these facilities are abusing their clients? I know I had a mother who, a godmother, a, a grandma, oh my gosh, my verbiage today. I had a grandmother who had Alzheimer's and I know it was really hard to put her in a hospital and my mom would deliberately visit visit her on random days at random times in case she was going to catch someone abusing her mom because it is very known that in American hospitals the elderly are being abused at a high rate and so you're always just hoping and praying you've paid for a facility and a group of nurses and doctors that aren't going to be that statistic but there is something to be said about the chances of this boy because he can't verbalize because he can't speak out for himself 
he's possibly going to be harmed. And that's really scary. I don't know if I could allow a baby to be a part of my body and then give it up for somebody else to be cruel to it. But to be tr- to be honest, I think the mother was already cruel. I think she already gave in to the cruelty. I think her husband gave into it. Her son obviously gave into it. Like her son was blaming this child. But ultimately, there is something bigger here to blame. And I think that's a lack of preparedness when choosing to bring a life into the world. No one chooses to exist. You force them into existence. You, the person getting pregnant, is forcing someone to exist. This kid never asked to be born. You did that to him. So for you to blame this child on how he impacted your life, you're the one who forced him to exist in the first place. So honestly, the blame has to be on the creator, right? There is, again, to parallel it to religion, this little narrative, right, that God is so upset in the Old Testament at his people Nobody has to be there. You're the one who made them, right? It's so ironic that parents make children and then get mad at the children for existing when they never asked to be here in the first place. So is it healthy? No. Is it happy? Obviously not. And is it kind? Absolutely not. Failed on all three counts. And it is self-inflicted. I'm not going to blame this child for never having chosen to be here. I'm not going to blame him. I would really like to hear your opinions on this one because it is so difficult. And I am always going to side on the the disabled human that didn't ask to be here, right? Versus the more than capable human who's chosen to have a um, a mindset, if you will, a perspective that is cruel. Being cruel is is not – there's – I don't see the reason for it in this situation, and I think I, I think that's the reality that we're dealing with with this story. There's just so unnecessarily cruel. Oh my God, I don't know if you guys could hear that, but it was outrageous. With that said, I would love to hear your comments in the sections below. Please leave those down below. If you guys would like to continue the discussion on the Discord, if you guys see me in there, let's do it because this is an interesting subject. Maybe I'll form an event around it actually because this kind of situation always makes me wonder, do I really want a child? Do I really want a baby? Am I really willing to accept any child that I give birth to? And am I ready to take on that responsibility of forcing a baby into existence, even if it turns out to be the worst case scenario? All right, guys, I'll talk to you guys soon. Have a great day. Bye. I'm just fine, yet all I do is whine Not to you in my mind, cause I know I don't make sense I've been nothing but blessed So why's my life a mess? Please tell me, cause I'm sick of thinking Yeah, I'm sick of reaching out for the truth And living life as a fool